Thanks. Thank you for coming out, guys. I appreciate you spending your Tuesday evening with us. Um, so yeah, that is pretty much everything I was just about to say about myself. So that's who I am. So we'll just skip that part. Um, and uh, the way I kind of got involved in this legal research is, I don't know if anybody remembers way a long time ago in 2014 when the Sony hack happened um, and all of that information came out. Um, and for the first time, we kind of had more information about what everyone was getting paid and the kind of an inside peek into the culture of one of those big six studios, um, which are always pretty notoriously secretive. Hi. Um, and so in November 2014, Sony Hack, that's where we begin. We have all this information coming out. And as a result of the Sony Hack, the ACLU wrote a letter um, demanding that the EEOC take some kind of action to correct the discrimination that was going on against female filmmakers. Um, and so the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission opened an investigation specifically targeting um, the discrimination against female directors, um, which was you know, pretty blatant. And so that went on for many years. And then in February, this is kind of the last we've heard of this investigation, um, they found that every major studio failed to hire female directors to such a egregious extent that it definitely violates the law. But so far, we have not found any. Um, there's no lawsuit that's been filed. There's no you know, settlement that's been published. I'm sure whatever settlement does occur will probably be pretty secretive, per usual, in Hollywood. Um, but hopefully, you know, just talking about it can really create some lasting change. And so even though this investigation has kind of stalled, I think the wheels of change are already in motion. And so there's a lot going on that's really helping to correct these issues. And so when we talk about gender inequality in the film industry, specifically, there's a lot of different layers to that. There's a lot of different sub-issues um, and a lot of different contributing factors. And so just for clarity and time, I'm going to talk about specifically three of them. Um, and then if you guys have questions about other things, because it's all related and there's so much going on today, feel free to like ask any questions at the end or in the middle or whatever. Um, and so first, the overarching issue that I'm going to talk about is this inherent gender bias, which is something that I think if you're a woman in the world, you have experienced no matter what industry that you're in. Um, but in the film industry specifically, you really see stereotypes from all different kinds of angles. And so you'll be um, people could be biased against you as a female filmmaker, or you could see a stereotypical character in film. So on either end of the medium, um, you're kind of experiencing that. And so just for clarity's sake, there's a couple of different kinds of sexism I wanted to talk about, uh, just so you can kind of pinpoint them if you're experiencing them, that sometimes it makes you feel better if you can identify them, and then you can decide how to handle them. But the first one is hostile sexism. And this is pretty traditional, what you think about when you think about sexism. It's like an open insult, an objectification, pretty black and white, straight and narrow. That is sexism. Benevolent sexism is less obvious. It's a little sneaky, little, you know, oh, this is kind of a compliment. You'd be a great mom. And I'm like, hmm. That's great, thank you, but also I'd be a great anything. Yeah, so that could take the form of a compliment, but then usually it leaves you feeling like a little, hmm, okay. So yeah, that's benevolent sexism. Seems nice, still a problem. Then this is my least favorite, internalized sexism is where what you say is super sexist and you just think that's how the world works. This one, there's a really specific example. Aaron Sorkin, a lot of his emails were leaked in the Sony hack. And so he has this string of emails where he talks about how every year the uh, best actor is such a stiff competition at the Oscars. All the men, they're really good and they work really hard and they're all so talented that the competition is so stiff and the women, you know, none of the women could ever compete with any of the men in the best actor category and it's just so easy to win an Oscar as a woman. To which I just have no response because I can't believe that anyone ever said that, but okay. Um, so that's internalized because he just truly sees the world that way, that male actors are more talented than female actresses and therefore their work should be valued more apparently. Not my favorite. This is a case that doesn't have anything to do with film actually, but the law can be applied to our industry to kind of help us work against these unconscious biases. The Equal, Opportunity, or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has already stated, and this is a federal court case, so it applies in all 50 states, but um, unconscious bias pervades the hiring process and continues once women are on set. These decisions are based 
on unthinking stereotypes or bias and they contribute to gender inequality. So sometimes, you know, especially with that internalized sexism, you don't even realize that the decision that you're making is having such an impact, but all the same, because it has such a discriminatory effect, it's not in line with the law. So this is one of my favorite quotes from Catherine Bigelow because I think this is just the perfect way to kind of deal with that internalized sexism in our industry. If there's a specific resistance to women making movies, I choose to just ignore that as an obstacle for two reasons. I can't change my gender and I refuse to stop making movies. So that's just, I mean, really, because even though there is a legal framework to fight against that inherent um, sexism, there's no, the proof is what's really hard in that case. So how can you prove that you weren't hired solely because you're a woman. If you make that charge, you know, to your possible employer, they're going to say, "Well, oh no, like we just went in a different creative direction." And that's really difficult to argue from a legal standpoint, and it's really difficult to prove. So the way we stop that is we just keep on going. Um, and so a lot of my research was statistics, which um, was fun because I love math, um, which is not true at all. But um, so one of my favorite, least favorite things is this legal concept, which is known as the inexorable zero, which is the Supreme Court has held that in any industry, there could be a statistical lack of women that is so egregious that it just proves that you're discriminating. So it's prima facie evidence and you can just say, okay, here are the stats, here's the math, the numbers don't lie, it's discrimination, which from a legal standpoint is just like you love when you get those solid facts and those solid answers and you don't have to keep digging. Um, so. Um, like I said, it's a statistical lack of women in a specific company or industry. It's a telltale sign of purposeful discrimination. Um, and they said it doesn't really matter what the reasons behind this discrimination are. Um, it could be on purpose. It could be unconscious. It doesn't matter. They're both actionable under the law. When you look at the film industry, the numbers are pretty clear. This is a 2015 study from USC, the Annenberg Institute. And so they just said across the board they were looking at a thousand odd movies from I think the last 10 years um, and they were the top grossing films in our industry and so you see 7.5 percent of the directors are women, 11.8 percent are women in writers, producers a little bit better, 22 percent, composers, there's just one woman out there by herself apparently working real hard so if anybody's into composing like we need more women in that industry for sure. When you look at how those women are hired, you have to look at who has the money, and that's the big six. And so there's the big six studios in Hollywood. Um, and so when you're looking at their leadership, they have you know very different power structures. There's lots of different titles. It's unclear who's making all the decisions all the time. But the Hollywood Reporter went in and did a studio scorecard where they tried to identify who is making the decisions as to where the money is spent. And so all of these people were executives at the company and they identified all the women. And Universal, as you can see, is doing very poorly with one woman. 20th Century did you know, pretty good, half and half. That seems fair. Um, but yeah, I mean, aside from 20th Century Fox, pretty bad news across the board. And so when you look at that, to me, that just says that the men are still controlling the money there. And so they're going to choose to continue to invest in men. All the statistics have shown that men hire men, and when we're looking at a thousand films from the last 10 odd years, you're looking at 24 male directors for every one female director, which is unfortunate. Even though it's been such an egregious disparity statistically, the law is pretty clear that this shouldn't be allowed to continue. Um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which was passed in 1964, is the foundation for how to fight this. Um, and so it's unlawful to discriminate based on sex. There's a lot of different um, things that you can't discriminate based on. Sex is a big one. What's illegal under Title VII? You can't limit, segregate, classify candidates for employment or current employees, so for promotions and things like that. Um, you can't use gender as a factor for compensation, benefits, conditions of employment, or promotional opportunities. That um, aspect of Title VII gets brought up a lot when you're talking about maternity leave or different other issues like that. Um, and then it also applies to labor organizations, agencies, training programs, and educational institutions, which is really important in our industry because agencies are such a huge part of how female directors can get more work or how female screenwriters can you know, expand their network and continue to grow in their career. 
Um, and so when the ACLU wrote their big letter, they cited Title VII and they said that Hollywood's failure to recruit, consider, or hire women for particular types of projects based on stereotypes about women's abilities, the traits a man or a woman typically has, or has assumptions about the types of projects for which men and women are best suited. This is just blatant discrimination. Um, and so that goes from the statistical lack of women to a stereotype that is really common in Hollywood that women can't handle war movies or you know women aren't well suited for the horror genre, which is just not true. But continues and people continue to perpetuate it. Um, and so what we're really seeing that's really disheartening is there's like a huge impact in the content that our industry is creating as a result of how few women there are. Research has consistently shown that behind the camera directing, directing is predominantly an occupation held by white males and that's the lens through which these men see the world. They're white men and they see the world like white men. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but there's a lot of different perspectives out there and so we as a community and as an industry should really be working harder to portray all walks of life and all lenses and all ways that people see the world. Um, and so instead of offering like a tilted view, hopefully we're working towards providing more diversity behind the camera. Um, and so, you know, when you have just white men making movies, you have 18 different variations of Spider-Man, which like is fine, but I always, I'm just shocked that it took, you know, three different Spider-Mans, Tobey Maguire was the original, I don't care what anybody says, um, before we got to a Wonder Woman movie, because Wonder Woman is awesome. And we have, you know, 48 Batmans, but one Wonder Woman. So I think that really speaks to how this, you know, male-dominated industry has affected the content that we're receiving. Um, and then the male gaze, which if anyone tells you the male gaze is not real, they are lying. The male gaze is a way of looking at the world through a masculine lens that views women as sexual objects. My proof that they're lying is right here. Um, so we have, this year we had Wonder Woman, who I just love, I just love her, um, and I love everyone involved in it. And so Wonder Woman and Justice League both came out in the same year, and they both have Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, and they both have these wonderful Amazons that she hails from, her people. And so would anyone like to take a guess as to which ones are from Wonder Woman, which was directed by a woman, and which ones are from Justice League, which was directed by a man. If you can see the lack of clothing, that's the men one. And like these women, they're ready for battle. They're, you know, important areas are protected from bullets. They, I think that's not gonna end well in the battle, because, you know, I'm just saying. But um, so there was a lot, this was big in the news a couple of weeks ago, but people were on fire on Twitter talking about this, and actually, this actress, the, the blonde one over there, she said, hey, listen, like, I know that the costumes are different, but I never felt disrespected on a Zack Snyder set. Like, he's very empowering. He's great for women, which is great, and I'm glad that he is, you know, an ally of a director and that he supports these female actresses. But at the same time, it's not so much just about their experience on set. It's about what everyone is going to see in the theater. And so for a little girl that's going to watch Wonder Woman, she's focused on, you know, them being badass and like kicking some butt. Whereas like it's a little distracting and it's just a different tone based on their costumes. And so it's not, I get that, you know, people were defending him and it's great that he empowers women, but at the same time, these movies came out in the same year, the actresses are the same, the like content, the setting, it's all the same. So like, why are we not using the same costumes? It just doesn't make any sense to me because if anything, it's a continuity issue, but you know. Um, so yeah, that's the male gaze. So then another big issue is equal pay for equal work. Um, and the law here, again, is a little less clear than the statistical issues, but still pretty clear. You can't um, have unequal pay for the same position. So two people in the same position should be paid the same no matter what their gender is. But the way that people kind of get around that and use loopholes is they are allowed under the law to use a seniority system, a merit system, a system which measures earning by quantity or quality of production, or anything except your gender, which could be literally anything. Like, I felt better that day, so I'm paying him more. I had a rough morning, so you're getting paid less. Um, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it really is any other factor. Um, so that's kind of how they're allowed to get around the loophole. And because in our society, in our industry, pay is such a closed door topic, it's kind of taboo to talk about, you know, contract negotiations are always really closed door and it's always really secretive. 
um, that kind of allows these studios and these companies to use the uh, law loopholes to their advantage to kind of continue that inequity in the way that people are paid. Again, the Sony hack, I'm not advocating hacking, but it really brought us a lot of great information. Um, we learned that in 2005, 85 of the top 100 earners working for Sony were male. You think, oh, like that's 2005, things have changed. Nope, just kidding. 2014, 17 Sony executives were earning $1 million or more annually, but only one of those executives was a woman, which is just not great. Um, and that's where Jennifer Lawrence, we found out that she was paid seven points for American Hustle and male co-stars, which was Christian Bale and Bradley Cooper, were paid nine points. They, the whole thing was they were on set similar amounts of time, they have similar amounts of lines, they're all considered leading roles. To the greatest degree that we can tell in the world of acting where everything is so subjective, those are the same position and they should be paid the same. So she got really mad about that and she wrote a great Lenny letter. If anyone hasn't read it, I would 10 out of 10 recommend. Um, and she really does identify a lot of the different elements as to like what contributes to this pay inequity. She talks about how she wanted to feel liked. She didn't want to be known as difficult because she had spoken up on set in the past and said like, hey, you can't treat me differently because I'm a woman, and then she was labeled as difficult. And so that's something that she talks about, and it's really going back to these kind of stereotypes and this inherent bias against women because, you know, as she says, men aren't ever cons worried about if they're gonna be labeled spoiled or difficult. You know, they don't have to think about how they frame what they're about to say in a meeting because they don't worry about stuff like that and their voice is just gonna be heard, whereas if she speaks up and arguably she could say the same thing that a man would say, but because she's a woman, people are gonna label her a certain way. That's a really big issue and it was really great to hear her kind of talk about that. And then another great thing that came out of this whole exchange was Bradley Cooper said, hey, I didn't know my female co-stars were being paid less than I was and so now I'm gonna share my, you know, I'm gonna share my information with them. So when I cut a deal for a movie and I'm working with Jennifer Lawrence, I'm gonna tell her, hey, I'm getting nine points, so you should fight for nine points. And that's really great and that's one way that I think a lot of male actors and directors and screenwriters or anybody in our industry could help alleviate the problem um, is by communicating with their female co-stars and co-workers. Um, and so the impact is, uh, this is a little quote from my entertainment's professor um, in law school, but he said the most important negotiable points of an entertainment contract are the money and the credit. And that's very true even outside of enter at the entertainment contracts, just in our industry in general, all, of, or all anybody ever talks about is the credit and the money and that is kind of your entire body of work at the end of the day is what are your credits and how much you got paid for it at the end. Um, but you know, this unequal pay reinforces a unbalanced power dynamic and so as we're seeing all of these harassment scandals come to light in our industry, uh, there's a lot of research that suggests that the more inequality exists you know, in unequal pay and in unequal positions of leadership, it really allows that culture of inequality and an unbalanced power dynamic to continue, which is kind of how all this harassment has a root in that. So we could really just fix everything if it was more equal and there were more women. This is a really exciting little bit of uh, research that just came out. Um, this year from the Harvard Business Review, and they said, training programs and reporting systems won't end sexual harassment, but promoting more women will. Which to me sounded like that's totally common sense and should have been done a long time ago, but luckily Harvard Business Review has now said it officially. So they say, you know, the different HR objectives or different reporting systems and programs that have been in place, they are effective to combating harassment, but they're not nearly as effective as promoting women. And so when women are put into positions of leadership, the culture of the company and the industry changes. And so that's how you can combat this harassment and these different abuse issues in our industry and in all industries. Um, and so allowing women to take promotion opportunities and occupy leadership roles really creates that culture that is anti-harassment. So I think Hollywood and probably everyone could benefit from more women. Men of quality don't fear equality. This is one of my good friends, Dr. Jill Murray said this. Um, she tweeted it the other day and I said, hey, I'm gonna use this. Um, because it's just really true because it's really important even though you know this is a women's organization and my research is all about women, you know, we're 50% of the population, the guys are still gonna be here too. And because so many men are still in power in Hollywood, it's really important to kind of identify who our allies can be and hope that they will get involved 
and um, you know help us reach equality because it's going to be good for everybody. Tom Hanks is a feminist now, so basically, if you're not a feminist, you hate Tom Hanks, and you, you just can't. Um, so research, research proves that including even one female filmmaker in leadership of a production led to more gender equality across the project. So if you have just one female producer, one female director, you're going to have a higher percentage of female writers, editors, cinematographers, and composers, which composers was the one where there's just that one poor woman hanging out there by herself. So um, that's just uh, some proof that really shows that, you know, like a rising tide raises all boats. And so the more we support our fellow female fil fellow female filmmakers, the more, you know, there's more opportunity for everybody. So I always love women supporting women, and I'm a big advocate of that. And, you know, there was this, this rumor and lie going around Hollywood for a really long time where executives would say, oh, you know, like nobody wants to buy a ticket to go see a movie about a bunch of women. And nobody wants to spend money to make a movie about a bunch of women. And then a bunch of women showed up and said, no, that's not true. Um, so, you know, we had Bridesmaids, we had Girls Trip. This year we had Lady Bird, Wonder Woman. Next year we're going to have A Wrinkle in Time. I'm super excited about that. It comes out on my birthday. It's just time and time again, even the consumers and the audiences are proving that they want female led films with real women, made by women, for women, just like great, complex characters, really well done work. And that's, I think, the biggest way that we're going to have a change in our industry. As much as there is legal support to change the industry, I think just by showing up to films that are directed by women and buying a ticket, you're making a huge difference. Um, and so that is something really great that I think our culture is speaking to right now. Um, and so, you know, like I mentioned before, when you're making a film, you're really showing the world how you view it and you're using your unique lens and so that's why you know no director is going to make the same script the same way it's always going to have a different twist and a different turn and i think that's really important and we need to celebrate all the different directors and the different storytellers that we have in our industry and really explore ways we can support diversity behind the camera because that's going to lead to diversity in front of the camera I mean, not even just for women, but for people of color um, and for every other, you know, diverse group in our industry, it's really going to help change the tone in which we portray people and characters. Um, and so I just think representation is very important and I'm very passionate about it and I hope that everybody gets really excited. So, you know, what do we do now? You support, excuse me, you support your female filmmakers. Um, so, you know, the Hawaii Women in Filmmaking have done such a great job of creating the next gen generation of female filmmakers. So come out on December 8th because they're having a film festival. And I think that's really how we're going to change the culture. We're going to change the dynamic and the industry. And hopefully, you know, the future of filmmaking will be female. And that's it.